Hello, everybody. I think we're going to start right, right away. Without any further ado, people will come back in and, and they'll catch up. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Hecht. I'm a managing partner at uh, Results for Development Institute. I've been asked to chair this uh, August panel. And uh, the topic here is uh, building this universal coverage system. I think we have, uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say I think we have the ideal panel uh, for this task because I have next to me uh, master electricians, plumbers, uh, sculptors, and painters. And uh, so building this uh, universal coverage system, we have all the right uh, tradespersons here to tell you how it, it's to be done. We have a very good division of labor, too, within this panel because uh, David Evans from WHO can uh, talk to you about the financing side of the universal system. Srinath Reddy from the Public Health Foundation of India uh, knows so much about uh, the, the service delivery building pieces, about the importance of getting essential services that really make a difference out to, to people uh, who need them. And Margaret Kruk, uh, to my right, from Columbia University, uh, We'll talk about the importance of uh, enhancing quality and how that can be done. And I believe uh, Tim Evans uh, mentioned the quality issue in the previous panel, so I think uh, Margaret can pick up on that. And then Yang Zhong, uh, here from the Council on Foreign Relations, a fellow uh, uh, knows uh, so much about the uh, Chinese uh, health reform and many other things, but he's going to focus on this issue that came up again in the previous panel around uh, how to go the last mile, how to reach the the marginalized uh, populations uh, in China in particular, where so much has been done, but there still are gaps in the system. So I think uh, we have just the, uh, the right people to take up this topic around uh, what can be done to build a stronger uh, universal system. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over uh, first to David Evans uh, to speak about the financing uh, building block in this universal coverage uh, edifice uh, and uh, what uh, David uh, has learned from vast experience uh, working at country level and working across, uh, across the world, among other things, as the, uh, the, the director and lead author of the uh, World Health Report uh, on universal coverage, which has been so instrumental uh, in bringing us to where we are here today. So David, over to you first. Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, can you hear me OK? Is that, is that loud enough? Thanks. Uh, usually when someone says you've got vast experience, it means you're getting old. So uh, thanks, Rob, for <laughs> saying I've got vast experience. Um, let me start with a few propositions. Moving closer to universal health coverage is not just about health financing. Rob's emphasized that. But if the health workers are not there, if they're in the wrong places, if they're badly motivated, you won't get there. If the medicines are not there, if they're in the wrong places or they're poor quality, you won't get there. If the health services that people need to use are not there in the wrong places or of poor quality, we can't move closer to universal health coverage. And some of the other panelists will talk about that. So let me move on to the second proposition. Health financing for universal health coverage is not just about raising more money. It is a little bit but it's not just about raising more money. And if I use English rather than jargon, health financing re requires a lot of interrelated decisions. And if you get it wrong in one of these decisions, again, it can be very hard to get closer to universal health coverage. And the decisions are who should pay, how much each should pay, when they should pay, what happens to the funds that are then collected in the sense of what services are available and then who benefits from those services. Each one of those decisions is part of this thing that we call health financing and each one of them is complex. My third proposition is that every country can do a little bit more in that mix of decisions. There's something that every country, no matter how rich or how poor, can do. As Jim Kim said, countries will have their own individual solutions depending upon their problems, their capacities, but global learning can tell us some experiences that each country would want to take into account when making those decisions. 
So let me quickly go through those questions and just say, what do we know? Who should pay and how much? Well, obviously, what economists call the principles of progressivity apply. People should pay according to their needs. No, uh, sorry, according to their abilities. Now, that's broad. Everyone can agree with that. But that also means that some people won't be able to pay. Some people won't be able to contribute in all societies, and they are subsidized. That means a role for public funding for the people that can't afford to pay. Second question, when should they pay? Well, you know the story about prepayment and pooling, that people should pay largely before they need to use the services rather than when they need to use the services. Paying at the time that people need to use the services stops people from getting the services and is the major cause of this 100 million people being pushed into poverty each year. So prepayment and pooling is important. Okay, we've got the pool funds. What should happen to them? Let me turn to who should benefit. Well, again, the principles are there, and people talked about it in the questions about vulnerabilities last, uh, last session, that people should benefit according to their needs. What needs do people have? That's what they should, they, they should get. Now, that's going to be, a, as, as, as we say, a, a, a progressive realization. It's not going to be. It's not going to be available immediately. It's going to be progressive realization. Let me, I was asked to say something about benefits packages as well. Before I do that, in terms of deciding what services are available and what should be provided, we've heard a lot about value for money. And I think it is important that the benefits package question is only one part of the question of how to use the funds that are available. There are other ways of improving efficiency and equity in the use of resources. In the World Health Report, we estimated that between 20 and 40 percent of health resources in many countries are wasted because of various forms of inefficiency. There's a lot that we can do to improve efficiency, even before we turn to the question of a benefits package. Let me, let me turn to that now, the benefits package. Uh, as you will recall, the the 1993 World Development Report talked a lot about essential package of services. And Jose Luis Bobadilla at the time spent quite some years going around countries trying to work with them to develop a benefits package. In WHO we had a lot of pushback from countries on that. Partly perhaps because they weren't making the financing changes necessary, but many countries said we don't want you outsiders helping us to develop a benefits package. It's got to be a homegrown benefits package. And so in WHO we focused much more on trying to say here's some tools that you could use to decide what interventions should and shouldn't be available. We produced something that you might have seen called the Choice Who Choice Project which now has something like eight or nine hundred interventions in it. We've done it for 14 sub-regions of the world and the fort, we have a, a country contextualization tool that countries can use to say, well, what would be a cost-effective set of interventions for our setting? There hasn't been good uptake of this tool. And I've been trying to reflect why. And I think the paradigm that we have used for cost-effectiveness and health technology assessment comes from developed countries. The problem is that the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK, for example, it asks a question, a new medicine becomes available, should we pay for it? It has the system that's sort of working, and it has to just say, do we pay for a new medicine? That's not the question that many of the countries that we work with are asking us. They're saying, well, and, and sorry, let me, let me just step back a little bit. And in those countries, they have a fundamental problem that when a patient presents at a primary health care level and when a patient presents at an outpatient, even at a secondary or hospital, you can't say, what's, this, what's your diagnosis? They won't know. You can't look up your book and say, is it in my package? I'll, you know, if, if you don't have the disease that's in my package of essential services, go away. You have to do something for the people that turn up at primary level. And so what 
the countries are asking us is, okay, what's the set of things that we should do at the community level, primary level, secondary level, tertiary level? And they don't ask that in terms of interventions. They say, what are the people that we need to have with what skills at the different levels? What are the medicines that we need to have there? What's the diagnostics that we need to have there? And when do we push people up the system? Or when do we have community-based interventions? What's the set of prevention promotion interventions that we need at the same time? And so I think that the way that we've been asking this question about packages and trying to answer it with cost-effectiveness type analysis is not the way that countries are asking the question and we need to do a lot more on that uh, to try and answer the questions that the countries are asking. What's the set of people with the skills that are needed in the community at the primary level, first level of care, secondary, tertiary level of care? What's the set of medicines, diagnostics, etc.? What's the mix of prevention and promotion that will back that up? And palliation as well is something that's becoming much more important now everywhere. So I'm still against trying to set packages from externally. I'm still against trying to say, here's a set of interventions that every country should do. Now that being said, obviously that's an extreme version that s most of the interventions that are currently in the MDGs you would expect that most countries would want to provide. Some of the basic interventions for non-communicable diseases, for, for um, uh, prevention, promotion, treatment of non-communicable diseases are something that we would want to see in almost every setting. But that being said, where, at what level of care should they be provided? There's a lot of work that we just haven't done there. And I think that that's something that we need to keep working on. Now let me just turn to the question. David, if I could stop sure. you there, because I think this would be a good place to hand over to Srinath. We can come back to you again. Uh, but uh, you've talked about packages of services. You've talked about guaranteed benefits. Uh, is there enough to give everything to everybody in these universal systems, or how do hard choices get made? Let me hand over to Srinath, because uh, uh, as president of the Public Health Foundation and also the uh, chair of a very important commission uh, last year or two years ago that produced a landmark report for the Indian government uh, on how to move toward universal coverage, Srinath, you've been thinking a lot about, uh, about this question of benefits and priority setting and how to get uh, especially primary care services of one kind or another to 1.2 billion people, not a small task, uh, especially given the uh, uh, burden of infectious disease and maternal and newborn child uh, issues, but also the growing uh, wave of uh, non-communicable diseases in India. So your thoughts on, uh, on this building block around services and how that can be created as part of these universal systems. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, good morning. I hope I'm audible. Uh, when we are really looking at uh, some of the problems we still continue to grapple with uh, even after the submission of our report, uh, when we talk about services and the essential benefits package, firstly, what is the range of services to be included? What is the outreach of those services? And are, what is the quality of those services? And all of them ultimately add up to effectiveness which will improve health outcomes. Now, in terms of range of services, universal health coverage basically has to look at health promotion, that's promotive services, preventive services, diagnostic services, therapeutic services, palliative services, and rehabilitative services. So it's not merely immediate acute clinical care that we are talking about. We are talking about a wide range of services. And we need to ensure that they have adequate quality. Now, which are the conditions that need to be really addressed? While the MDGs were very useful in focusing attention on maternal child health, for example, or HIV, TB, malaria, you know, among the infectious diseases, they segmented life into different areas, missing out some important link areas like adolescence, for example. They also fragmented the health system by having extremely siloed vertical programs. There have been some advantages, but there have also been some disadvantages. So really, when we are looking at universal health coverage as the unifying platform, 
we are really looking at a life course perspective, which provides a range of needed health services to everybody across the course of their life, but that also requires prioritization. And prioritization in this case is, firstly, primary health care to everybody in rural and urban areas. And that includes a wide range of preventive, promotive, as well as some basic clinical services. At the same time, we are really looking at combining maternal and child health, the new priorities of non-communicable diseases, mental health, essential surgery. Usually, some of the necessary surgical procedures are not always available in primary health care. They have to strengthen district hospitals for providing those services, or even emergency obstetric care, which is referred to. So we are not really saying we'll first cover primary health care, then only we'll take a step up. We are saying let's do primary health care, but we also need to accommodate some elements of secondary and tertiary care, which are higher levels of care. Then we are also looking at where are these services going to be provided? Is there adequate infrastructure, right from the sub-center level in the primary health care system to the district hospital and then the medical college hospital or whatever? Who will provide these services? Are the human resources adequate in numbers, skills, motivation? Are they appropriately distributed or is there a huge urban aggregation like in India where about 70% of the doctors are in urban areas which have 30% population? So how do we deal with some of these issues? Then is there a multi-layered health workforce? Are there enough nurses? Are there enough community health workers? Are there enough allied health professionals? Very frequently, we think of a doctor-centric medical system. But we now need to think of a multi-skilled, multi-layered health workforce where many of the functions performed by specialist doctors can be transferred to non-specialist doctors, from doctors to specialist nurses, and to allied health professionals, the so-called task shifting. Then how can non-physician healthcare providers be enabled with modern technologies? so that their skills can be substantially enhanced to undertake these kind of functions, especially in primary health care. Is the health system being adequately managed? Is there public health expertise? Is there managerial expertise? Those questions come in. Is it having proper governance? Does it have regulatory systems? Is the country adequately empowered with drug regulation and regulation of human resources and so on? What is the extent of community participation and ownership? These are all questions that come in in universal health coverage and need to be accommodated. And we are dealing mainly with mixed health systems here in, the, in many of the countries and especially in India. So we are talking about public-private sectors and we frequently hear of public-private partnerships sometimes being distorted because of the lack of appropriate regulation of cost and quality. And the cynics will say this is partnership for private profit. That's what PPP is. On the other hand, PPP should be partnership for public purpose. Define the public purpose, define the deliverables so that each one has to give, and define the terms of accountability. So uh, the private sector can be both a provider, and even the non-health sector private sector can bring in a huge amount of managerial expertise like supply chain management, etc. The civil society is important both in demand generation of services, in participating in community-led service delivery, as well as in monitoring and serving as a watchdog. So all of these elements need to be brought in. Now, how is India faring in this? We started off with the National Rural Health Mission with a major focus on primary health care, but with maternal and child health. So the other areas have been somewhat neglected. We have seen benefits in terms of reduced maternal mortality and accelerated decline of infant mortality, but we now need to extend to other areas as well. Then we are looking at a separate scheme for financial protection, the Rashtriya Swasti Bhima Yojana, or the National Health Insurance, which has been looking at secondary hospitalized care and some of the state insurance programs which have been looking at hospitalized tertiary care. Now, there's been no link up here between the primary care and secondary care and tertiary care, and one can frequently defeat the objectives of the other. So the challenge before us now is how do we combine all of these so that we can have all the necessary services provided from primary to tertiary care as needed with a continuum of care, particularly with people having care in tertiary level and secondary level, returning back to primary care where they can be appropriately followed up so that unnecessary escalation of healthcare costs need not occur. So how can they be connected? Can there be financial sustainability? Are the poor adequately covered? Or are their entitlements linked to some sort of a civic identity number 
and some of the poor may not have it, are they in any sense uh, being distanced from it? All of these issues we need to answer. However, I believe that universal health coverage at least has opened up these questions for discussion, and I'm sure with careful thought we can find answers, especially by comparing international experiences and then adapting them to our local context. Thank you very much, Srinath. That's fantastic. Uh, when you describe all the things that need to be done in India, it feels daunting and practically uh, uh, disempowering to me. So it'll be good when we get into the discussion to hear about where you think uh, things uh, should start and where the priorities have to be set. Um, and also, um, you talked, uh, I think, about the role of both this, uh, the, the role of government both in investing on the supply side in a stronger uh, health delivery system, but also uh, through public insurance and other demand side mechanisms trying to uh, motivate the right kinds of performance. It'll be interesting to hear about how you see the balance between those two, given that the Indian government uh, has a lot of uh, resources and wants to devote more to health. Uh, but in the end, uh, that those budgets are still limited. Uh, your vision of how that, uh, that uh, pie should be divided between these investments on the supply uh, and, and then the stimulation of these uh, insurance uh, arrangements to protect people on the, uh, on the financing. Let me turn to Margaret. Uh, people keep talking about uh, quality and quality uh, as being essential. If that's not a, a, an ingredient or an element in universal coverage, this is all going to fail if we just think about quantity and not quality. So uh, what are the key lessons and the secrets there to uh, enhancing uh, quality within these universal systems? Thanks very much. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, it is on. on. All right, you. So I need to maybe hold it. Is this better? No. It, it is on. Oh, let's go with that. Ah, okay, okay, great. Uh, okay, so that's better. Even I can hear me. Uh, thanks very much, Rob, and thanks to CSIS for convening this conversation. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a gadfly. Uh, I want to start with uh, with some figures uh, for you. Actually, one figure: uh, forty percent. In uh, 2012, in the coast region of Tanzania, 40% uh, of women living within walking distance to free healthcare bypassed that facility to deliver at the hospital, public or private. Mm. These weren't just rich women. Poor women were almost as likely as rich women to do this. Women living near a weak facility were much more likely to bypass. In 2011, out-of-pocket payments uh, constituted 40% of the overall healthcare spend in Chile, a country that has achieved universal health coverage uh, and has a coexisting private uh, health system. Um, by contrast, out-of-pocket payments were 9% in the UK, another country with UHC and a private health system alongside. Uh, what's the link between these statistics? Um, I would suggest it's quality. Uh, by quality, we certainly mean competent doctors, the kinds of things that Dr. Reddy uh, 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 talked about, and available medicines. Yes, but also uh, attentive and respectful treatment and responsiveness to people, to patients as people. Um, this is the factor that we heard loud and clear, um, drives Tanzanian women to, uh, to seek higher cost facilities and spend much more to get there. And it also drives Chileans to private providers for second opinions and for, uh, for more and better technology. Quality also includes meeting the needs of the population, the needs and expectations. We know from survey research that people value health hugely from the Lancet Commission, from, from various polls. Health is one of the top priorities globally whenever you ask people about what matters. Um, and because of that, I think, and because of the, the globalized world we live in, uh, people are increasingly sophisticated healthcare consumers and very explicit about what they want. We ignore this at our peril, and we ignore it at our peril not just in this country where we're beginning to focus on it. Um, I was in an emergency department with my daughter a couple of weeks ago and got the customer satisfaction survey within 24 hours, but we're also focusing on it and need to focus on it in poor countries, as Tanzanian women have shown us, uh, who are bypassing primary care there. The success of UHC, I would suggest and agree with Rob, hinges hugely on quality, on delivering on quality, and this is for three reasons. First, we know from, from uh, extensive research now that quality drives utilization. Uh, we, uh, we need to have quality facilities to get people into them to, to achieve the convergence agenda, to get maternal uh, uh, mortality figures down, uh, and improve uh, outcomes and NCDs. 
Further, to get health out of that healthcare visit, we actually need quality to be there when people get to the facility. Um, and so the new service utilization that we're hoping to get with universal health coverage will only improve outcomes if we can convert that into, into uh, um, good uh, services that, that reach a specific outcome. And actually, Tim and others have already pointed this out, and the notion of effective coverage really captures this very well. And thirdly, to keep out-of-pocket spending down and keep it from burdening families, uh, we need to protect families from using unnecessary services, getting unnecessary second opinions, seeking higher level facilities and higher level providers uh, to, to get the care they feel they need and deserve. Um, how do we get there? Well, I would suggest the starting point in terms of quality uh, in the UHC discussion is just to talk about it and be more explicit about it. Right now, it's sort of a, an adjective that get ad gets added onto the coverage agenda, quality health services, we should have everyone get to those. Um, but it, I think we have to be much more serious uh, and explicit about what we mean by quality. Countries won't be able to afford, as Ashwinda just pointed out, everything that people need and want. Um, not for uh, countries that are spending $30 per capita, $60 per capita, $1,000 per capita or more. Um, and so uh, countries do need to expand the package available at that first level of care from a bare bones package to something much more comprehensive. And I think Mexico and other countries have shown us the way to do that uh, by starting with 30 or 40 interventions and going up to 200 uh, conditions that are covered. And I think equally as important is communicating that path to people. It's not just to say we're gonna do it from a policy perspective, but really making clear um, that that's what's going on and that's the intent. Uh, the second thing is the aggressive, an explicit and aggressive focus on quality. Uh, work from, by John Peabody and others from the Philippines shows, for example, that performance-based financing combined with communicating quality results to providers uh, can improve outcomes and not for a lot, large investment. Uh, we have an experiment right now in Tanzania to see how we can learn from HIV experiences with improving quality in very resource-constrained settings uh, to improve healthcare rapidly across the system. Um, and, you know, quality is not a perk for the rich. I really want to emphasize this. I think sometimes we, we, we think of it that way. Uh, the poor should just be grateful for the services that they get. It is not a perk for the rich. The rich will always find a way to, find, to get good quality health care, UHC or not. In fact, quality, high quality services are a bedrock promise to the poor uh, and, uh, and protect that poor in terms of health but also financial consequences. I think if we're serious about quality, I would challenge us to come up with some quality targets that go into the set of targets, for example, that complement the targets, that are excellent targets, I think, that WHO and World Bank have proposed. Um, if we're serious about, uh, about the issues of, of not just access, but actually outcomes and, and responsiveness. Um, the audacity of universal coverage, and I do think it's an audacious goal, and this has been emphasized all morning, has to be matched by commitment to quality. I think uh, without it, we risk a paper edifice, uh, Rob, and not something substantial. Thanks. Thank you. Is that working still? Still online? OK, good. Uh, thank you, Margaret. That was uh, great. And we'll come back to the question of what needs to be done. What can, uh, what can governments do? What can uh, some of the international agencies, what can Tim Evans do about uh, about quality, what can uh, REL and USA do about, uh, you know, about uh, quality? So we'll come back to that in the, in the, question, in the question period. Uh, let me turn now to Yang Zhong uh, Wang. And uh, this uh, whole issue of uh, really uh, closing the loop entirely, uh, reaching uh, those who uh, in some ways have historically been the most uh, deprived and discriminated against uh, is coming up in a very uh, real and pressing way in China right now. So tell us about universal coverage uh, getting to uh, getting the last few percent uh, in, inside the program and uh, the challenges and the opportunities for a country like China. Thanks. Well, thank you, Robert. Can you hear me? OK, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve and Nelly, for inviting me over. It's, oh, it's great to be back. And uh, I'm going to. Um, talk about uh, the China's uh, experience uh, in um, extending uh, health coverage uh, to especially the vulnerable population uh, in the country. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, before China kicked off the new so-called new health care reform in 2009, that there's a large percentage of the population not covered by any health insurance. 
uh, we have the data in 2003, for example, nearly 80% of the rural population was not covered by any health insurance. And access is also a problem because 80% of the health insurance, uh, res I'm sorry, 80% of the uh, health resources essentially is concentrated in the urban areas, especially the large urban health centers, right? So uh, the, it's very difficult for the rural residents to have access to health care as well. Uh, but the, um, uh, the new health care reform uh, with the central aim to addressing uh, these issues of access and affordability, uh, they have uh, invested tremendously uh, to fill the gap. Uh, actually, over the past four years, between 2009 and 2013, uh, the government has invested a total of 371 billion U.S. dollars uh, in the healthcare sector, uh, including more than 100 billion dollars from the central government. Uh, and um, progress has been made uh, in strengthening uh, the grassroots healthcare centers, uh, uh, the um, township health uh, institutions, for example, and also the equalization of the uh, public health care. And uh, another shining spot is the, uh, in the maternal and the child health care. Um, the, um, the government um, over the past years have invest, uh, invested tremendously uh, in this sector, uh, reducing uh, the child mortality rate uh, from 2.47% in 1996 to 0.93% uh, in 2008. In fact, the uh, percentage of female uh, the, uh, delivery uh, in the uh, rate um, in the hospitals, uh, the uh, female delivery rate actually increased from 50% in 1988 to 100% today. Uh, and uh, the, just, uh, I think, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, there's this the announcement from uh, UNICEF, I believe, uh, that uh, the, uh, between 1990 and 2012, uh, there was the, uh, essentially uh, the 50% uh, drop in the child mortality rate. Actually, China contributed 26% uh, of that decline. Um, so that was a quite achievement, especially uh, given the the huge population in China, we talk about nearly 1.4 billion people, right? Um, but right, that being said, well, you know what I'm going to say, uh, the, uh, the picture is actually not that rosy. Uh, if we uh, look at the, the, uh, the recent uh, government data and also the survey data that uh, was most recently released in October uh, 2013, we found that access and affordability remain two major problems in China. Uh, access, 81% uh, of the respondents say it is difficult to see a doctor. Uh, actually, more than 57% say it actually becomes even more difficult than four years before to see a doctor, compared to 20% who said there was improvement. Affordability, 95% of respondents agreed uh, that it is expensive uh, of seeking care in China. 87% agreed that the cost is actually higher than four years ago, or four years before. And only 3.5% say it is becoming less costly. In fact, uh, you probably read that, uh, they heard that this report last October, there was this farmer in Hubei province self-amputated uh, his leg, you know, simply because he couldn't afford hospital bills. Uh, the, um, well, this disappointing outcome of healthcare reform can also be reflected in official data uh, access. Again, we found that uh, um, daily visits uh, each doctor received increased from uh, 6.7 in 2009 to 7.3 uh, in 2011. That, was, uh, the, that means the workload for a doctor increased by 9%. And for inpatient services, the workload for each doctor um, increased by 23% during the same period. Affordability. During 2007 and 2011, we found that the healthcare cost in China continued to increase uh, at the annual rate of 10%, much higher uh, than uh, the, uh, not much higher, higher than China's GDP growth rate. Uh, that probably explains why that conflict between healthcare providers and patients continue to be a problem, actually becoming even worse in China. 
according to a survey conducted by China Hospital Association, uh, between 2008 and 2012, the proportion of Chinese hospitals reporting uh, violent conflicts between patients and healthcare providers increased from 47 uh, 48% to 64%, while the average number of violent attacks directed at healthcare workers in each hospital covered by the study um, increased by nearly 30%. Uh, from 21 to 27. There are also other problems. Low benefit level is an, a, a, a certainly a very, uh, still continue to be a challenge. Uh, the so-called universal health coverage actually only covers the basic health care services. Other services like dental care, right, mental health, non-communicable diseases, actually essentially are still not covered. According to a New England Journal of uh, um, uh, medicine, uh, the research conducted by the uh, st study found that 60% of the Chinese diabetes patients are not aware of their conditions because despite the nearly universal health coverage in China, screening and outpatient services for diabetes are not yet covered medical benefit in many parts of the country. So as a result, a large number of the patients do not seek care until they have developed symptoms or worse, are in the later stages of diabetes. Um, in the meantime, if you look at the migrant population, 200 million migrant population, even though they are nominally covered, but because that insurance, um, so-called new corporate health insurance, are not portable, so a uh, large percentage of them actually are not covered. Uh, so um, to, um, uh, uh, before I uh, wrap up, I want to um, point it out that despite the tremendous progress China has achieved uh, in um, pursuing universal health coverage, right, including uh, actually the, uh, the, uh, the significantly enlarged size of the pool, uh, it still has a long way to go uh, before they could fundamentally solve the problem of access and affordability. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Yang Zhong. And uh, I'm glad, I'm so glad that uh, China is being included in this uh, discussion because it seems to me that uh, some of the other moves toward universal coverage, uh, Mexico has been well documented, uh, Thailand is very well known, uh, the Thais are very good at uh, telling their story, um, but I think the Chinese reform is very, very significant and in some ways is the stealth reform of the last decade. So I would urge everyone to read your work and uh, Professor Shaw's and some of the other key authors uh, and I think you point out that despite the uh, enormous changes and a lot of the gains, there are still some uh, very severe problems of, of access uh, and uh, effective coverage uh, and also uh, cost control issues, which I think you, you mentioned as well. So uh, the lesson there is uh, uh, as you push on one part of the system, uh, other things tend to bulge out, new problems emerge, and uh, reform is a continuous process. It never goes away. Uh, all the problems uh, are not solved at one fell swoop, and there's always uh, more to, to address as uh, a country progresses. Let me uh, turn back to each of the panelists and ask uh, an easy question or two uh, just to get the discussion started, and then uh, we'll, we'll open it up. I think we're, we're doing pretty well on the time, so uh, we're getting back on track. David, um, I did want to come back to where, um, I apologize for cutting you off, but you were, you were uh, talking about your misgivings around how uh, benefits uh, are defined and prioritized within countries. You mentioned that some of the earlier work around cost effectiveness and uh, some of the things that grew out of the World Development Report in 1993, which I was uh, one of the culprits uh, 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 and, and uh, consp conspirators on, um, that this uh, is not the way that countries should be going. I think there's another process here uh, that you uh, are calling for that you feel is more appropriate or is working better uh, in some of the countries in, in 2014. Maybe you could just say a little bit more about uh, uh, what you think are some of the principles and, and good practices in countries uh, wrestling with these diff difficult choices and trying to come up with a consensus around uh, where to set priorities and what, what should be uh, uh, featured and what should potentially be uh, deprioritized or even excluded from some of the uh, guaranteed benefits. I think Srinath uh, in, in India 
picked up that 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 point a little bit that because someone coming in uh, at the presenting at the primary level you can't turn away you have to do something you have to then make your decisions not necessarily based on interventions but based on the mix of inputs that you need at that level so you need to have a, f a philosophical viewpoint of well, what are we going to do at the community level what are the primary the first level le uh, what are the second level what are the tertiary level and then what's the mix of people medicines diagnostics that are available now obviously that has to take into account the mix of diseases and problems that are in that community uh, but also a question of where do you want people treated so the push to have people women delivering in facilities is a specific recommendation that people don't deliver at home and and these types of questions where would screening for diabetes take place uh, where would treatment for hypertension take place uh, what is the level of, of care that you would need and I think that's the question I mean uh, Chris Murray has been doing a little bit of work recently with Josh Salomon uh, from Harvard on trying to redefine the at the level of care uh, what is that mix of interventions and the implications for people and medicines and drugs that that need to be put there. Now that all needs to be put in the context of the availability of funds and as you as you said earlier on uh, the funds are not there for most countries to get to even a very minimum level of universal health coverage. So what do you do? Uh, the, the, the video suggested $60 per capita. Um, Di McIntyre from Cape Town University has just tried to re redo that, bringing it up to 2012 prices rather than 2009 prices. She gets $86, but it's still there or thereabouts, and most of the developing countries are not there yet. They won't be there for the next 5, 10, 15 years. So external assistance is required at the moment for the poorer countries. And so let me raise a philosophical question. We're all committed to universal health coverage, but when does our commitment for global solidarity, solidarity in helping countries get there phase out? I'm uncomfortable with saying that once a country becomes a middle income country or a low middle income country, we forget about them, they're on their own. Uh, now this is an ethical question as well and everyone's we, we had a very interesting discussion at Chatham House recently about when do people think in health the global solidarity should phase out if someone a country has 60 years life expectancy but they're a middle-income country do we say you're on your own uh, we believe in the principles but we don't need to contribute and I think we'll all, we'll all come up with different philosophies about that and uh, it's a little bit like giving uh, charity that I probably don't give charity to my next door neighbor because he's got a car and he earns he earns less than me but he's got a car so he's on his own I only give charity to the Salvation Army because I believe that they're they're actually looking after people that are much much worse off than me do we do the same thing in health when is the gap between what they have and what we have sufficient for us to say we don't engage in global solidarity? Thanks, David. Well, let's come back to this question of the role of the international community and the organizations. In fact, Srinath, let me turn to you on that one because uh, Tim earlier said that uh, there is a role for the international organizations on universal coverage. He said it's not around massive uh, financial transfers. It's in these other four areas that he articulated. When you think about India, huge country, a lot of its own financial resources, and also a lot of uh, very uh, uh, well-trained people, a lot of good policy makers and technicians. Where, where do you see uh, key roles for the uh, international community in uh, supporting India on its uh, universal coverage uh, quest? Uh, certainly, despite uh, some slowdown in the growth rates recent, in recent years, I think India's uh, economic position at the moment does not require massive financial assistance. On the other hand, it will still benefit from technical assistance. And international organizations should be able to bring in the technical assistance. Particularly when you are at the very beginning of designing a universal health coverage program, there are likely to be mistakes made, which if not corrected in design or at an early stage, can cost us very dear as we move along. 
So it is very important to have the international experience and critique also come in, apart from technical assistance coming in, but training special categories of people, uh, health workers as well as health system managers and so on. The other area which I believe and uh, where both uh, Tim and uh, President Jim Kim mentioned is to bring in the other sectors to support the health goals. Now, uh, Jonathan uh, Quick mentioned a three-legged stool. I don't know whether this is the fourth leg of the stool or not, the whole area of multisectoral collaboration or whether it fits into the three stools. But the question is, if the policies and programs in other sectors are not sensitive and responsive to public health concerns, then we will continue to face a rising tide of disease which could have been easily averted. But how do we actually bring in joint ownership of the goals and shared accountability across ministries? This is where institutions like the World Bank should be able to do it because they engage with multiple ministries, multiple agencies. So how do they actually bring them on a convening platform? So these are the kind of questions that we should be asking of international agencies beyond the money they bring in. Thank you, Sridhar. Uh, Yang Zhong, let me turn to you, uh, and then I'll come to Margaret, and, and then we'll open things up. Uh, but ra as part of this sort of rapid-fire round, um, you, you uh, highlighted uh, some of these, uh, let's call them unintended negative consequences, if I can put it that way, putting it kindly, uh, some of the things that have emerged that are problematic in the Chinese uh, health system, even as a lot of impressive reforms have taken place. Um, are there any... Uh, prescriptions or any policy recommendations that, uh, that, that you're making or that the government is now trying to undertake to uh, correct and adapt uh, the system to deal with some of the, 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 the dilemmas and the problems that you've, you've highlighted? Yeah, with all that, uh, I just to say, I'm still optimistic about the, the prospect of the, uh, the <laughs> success of the Chinese health reform, in part, as actually this is also indicated by uh, Dr. Jim Kum in this, this morning, that. Uh, you know, there's several important uh, factors, I think, uh, would contribute to the success include uh, the um, robust economic growth, right? very strong the political leadership, political determination, that are still there. Right? And in fact, uh, recently, the, the Chinese President Xi Jinping you know, actually uh, uh, emphasize this concept of social justice and fairness. You know, and, uh, and obviously, I think that uh, the UHC will still be uh, top on the uh, leader's agenda. But uh, um, uh, I think the um, UHC, as we all know, is not just about health financing. If uh, uh, you could uh, you know, inject all the money into the health sector you know, in a very short period of time, extend the coverage, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can solve all the problems because you need to have a holistic, integrated approach uh, in tackling uh, the healthcare reform. You know, for example, in China, uh, even though in the public hospital reform, you know, even the government admitted that it should be the core of the healthcare reform agenda, but uh, so far, <laughs> the government has not taken, uh, been very serious about reforming the public uh, hospitals. And also, even though we know that uh, you know, more money should be spent on the demand side, but uh, um, so far, only one third of the money actually is injected to the demand side. Uh, Two thirds of the money still goes to uh, the, uh, the supply side. And uh, we know, well, this is the supply side, you know, that uh, uh, David mentioned that 20 to 40 percent of the money actually is wasted. You know, actually, uh, in China, despite it, over the, uh, the, the the past four years, billions of dollars, you know, that the, the government has injected to the healthcare sector and the, to the demand supply side, right? Still, the uh, percentage of the uh, the government uh, the, uh, the share uh, the revenue uh, the, the in terms of the composition of the hospital revenues, I mean, the government hospital, uh, the public hospitals. Uh, the government share is less than 10% still. Right? Uh, so uh, we, uh, I think it's very important for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, policy makers in China to um, really now focus on some of these, these most, uh, I think, important uh, uh, things on the healthcare uh, agenda. And also this issue of access, right? Uh, the, uh, one of the problems that uh, uh, exacerbated the access is because of the male distribution of healthcare resources, right? Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the patients would have to uh, 
go to see a doctor in the major open health centers that causes all the problems. So why not actually, uh, for example, improve the, uh, the quality of the doctors walking, who walk at the, uh, the grassroots level in the countryside by significantly improving their salary level, you know, to keep them stay uh, that uh, uh, there instead of you know, giving them the dissent, disincentives of staying in the community level uh, centers. Great. Thank you very much. And let me just, Margaret, to um, go around one time here and then open up. We have 30 minutes left, so I hope you're uh, cooking up some really hard questions because mine are the easy ones. Um, on, the, on the quality side, uh, I mean, I see Daniel Cotliar here. He's, a, he's an economist, so he's, uh, he, and Jesse Bump. So they re reduce these things to uh, questions of uh, payment and prices and so on. Um, some, some of the economists here might argue that the quality issue is really all about financing, that if, uh, if these countries were just uh, setting up ways to pay for quality and, and pay for performance, that this quality issue would go away. What's, what's your view on that? Uh, necessary but not sufficient, uh, I think, is, is my answer to that. Uh, absolutely, investing in uh, trained providers. You know, we, we were here, uh, Ariel, I, a few others, uh, uh, many, some of you perhaps, earlier this week, looking at the successes of Saving Mothers Giving Life. Our team did an evaluation as a large program to return, reduce maternal mortality. We found that one of the investments that was particularly effective was actually investing in physicians. I know they're not hot, they're not sort of the, the, the topic of the day. We're all talking about task shifting. But in a health system that's extremely constrained with very few practicing doctors, in, infusing physicians into the system actually raised the quality of care, the expectations for care uh, for all women in, in that setting. So investments in uh, some uh, incredibly important inputs um, are, are absolutely essential. But I think, uh, you know, the experience of India, the experience of China and other countries has also taught us that that's not enough. There are many brilliant doctors in India and China, uh, what, and Thailand and other places. The, the other issues are issues of political will, policy design, um, maldistribution, uh, for example. We know doctors and nurses aren't just led by money. Uh, for example, when they decide about where to practice, we, we have evidence on that. The issue of regulation has been, I think, understressed in this discussion. All of these are policy level decisions that, that may or may not cost a huge amount of money. Some of them, some of them do and some of them don't, so not, not enough. Great, great, thank you. I don't think there are any, any hot physicians in here. I don't know about that, but <laughs> we'll, we'll check during the lunch hour. Um, let me open it up. Uh, we still have 25, 30 minutes. Um, let's take uh, three or four comments and questions. I'll take uh, moving across the room so as not to discriminate. Please, go ahead right there. Thank you, my name is Nirali Chakraborty from PSI. Um, and I have a question, comment related to the issue of quality. Um, I'm very happy to see it being discussed and the idea of um, you know, quality adjusted coverage that uh, Tim Evans mentioned. I'm curious in the context of the countries in which we're talking about, low and middle income countries, um, your ideas for how we go about kind of ensuring quality, because I would suggest that in the US and in other developed countries, quality is assured not necessarily through um, policies per se, but often through the threat of lawsuits and, and things of that nature. And so I'm, I'm curious to, to, to ask, you know, how, what kind of systems, what kind of policy interventions, regulations would you think would need to be created in order to improve quality. Great. Thanks. So you're suggesting we export medical malpractice lawyers to other countries? <laughs> Got it. Okay. Well, that's taken care of. Let's do one from the middle benchers here. Um, please, go ahead. Um, my name is Niranjan from Management Sciences for Health. Um, Dr. Srinath mentioned about the whole continuum starting from, you know, diagnosis, prevention, therapeutic, and so on. Um, given that, and given your point about uh, regulation, and given this morning's brief acknowledgement on access to medicines, you know, given all these different pieces here, what I'm realizing is, is, any, is anybody thinking about access to medical devices, access to health technologies? Because I'm sure everybody in this room knows about the tumultuous history of drug pricing, and how that plays a big role in the design of universal health coverage. And Ariel earlier mentioned about potential of increasing demand, inflation, and so on. If that's the case, um, given what we know about uh, ineffective or poor regulation of medical devices and the perverse incentives that go into the whole system, is that a blind spot? And what can we do about it? 
Thank you. Okay, medical devices, medical technology, prices for pharmaceuticals, a lot of issues here. Um, let's take one from this side. Yes, please, uh, in the middle back there. Hi, my name is Tina Curry, uh, Return Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and I was wondering from the middle income countries, if there are any examples of pressure that residents from those countries are putting on their respective governments to make change. Um, during my service um, in Madagascar, uh, my second year there was a strike uh, that happened at the health center. And it was really interesting to watch when people came to the health center, realized that it was closed, they didn't seem angry or upset, and just kind of wondering if there's examples from some of the middle income countries where residents are putting pressure on their um, respective governments to create change in their health system. Okay, thank you. Let's take uh, one or two more. These are really easy questions. We're still looking for some hard ones. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Thanks, Lydia Ogden, um, Emory University Rollins, and also Merck Vaccines. Piggybacking on this question, um, not only how do we assure quality, but how do we collectively define quality? And is it possible to come to some collective definition? Thank you, and let's, let's take one more, and then we'll do another round. You've been waiting very patiently. Thanks, but I think you had a chance last round too, so no, but go ahead, please. Thank you very much. My name is Jin Nguyen. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Wang and also the India, uh, because both of you, these two big countries, has significant amount of populations, 1.3, 1.2 billion. So the question has to do with the Food and Drug Administration Agency. Is that in the thinking of the government? Uh, is there any way that we can suggest that? Because uh, we very much have concern with the toxin and toxic and fo uh, fake medicines being sent over to our to Vietnam, and Vietnam has suffered a lot of problems in health from ingesting food and drugs that has um, toxin in it. And we have wanted, we have wondered if, with the significant um, economy that China has and the huge amount of money that you invested in the, uh, the healthcare system, is there a thinking of having a Food and Drug Administration to, to somehow ensure the quality of food and drugs being ingested by the population? Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, I see more hands, but let's, let's allow the panel to answer. I think, Margaret, a lot of the questions here relate to, <laughs> to quality, so see, people seem to want to hear more from you. Uh, well, I think the quality uh, actually is a feature that's uh, central to all the presentations, but let me, let me take a first crack. Um, around the malpractice question, uh, so I would say, uh, also as a former physician, to be completely uh, transparent here, never a fan of the malpractice lawyers, I'm not sure this is the most efficient um, way to enforce quality. I think that's what we're finding here in the U.S. health system, that in fact it adds to the, to the healthcare costs with all sorts of defensive medicine and um, yeah, potentially unnecessary services. But um, there are other successful things that um, somehow and, and many middle income countries are, are trying to do now in the sphere of regulation, uh, licensing regulation, uh, and maintenance of certification. Um, it's not just good enough to be licensed the first time, but, but how do you maintain that licensure? What about private providers entering, entering the system? What, you know, the idea that you can hang up any shingle outside your uh, office is, is very disturbing and still very prevalent in, in many countries. Um, and, and critically, where are the professional organizations in this? Where are the professional organizations who should be uh, active and decrying poor quality, uh, who should be policing their own members? Uh, those are the sorts of things that could be strengthened and potentially with some support from the global community as well. Um, then second piece, I think, on ensuring quality is giving, putting, um, putting this in the hands of the population. We know very well that populations um, get and appreciate and value high quality care. Why don't we let them know what the quality of care is like at their nearest health center, at their nearest hospital, and let them vote. Um, on whether they will go there and get care. And if hospitals are uh, interested in seeing volumes and in seeing flows, again, the financing system has to support this, uh, I think we're gonna see some change. 70% um, and upwards of that, uh, of the population now in rural areas that I study and in, in, uh, in work in in Sub-Saharan Africa have mobile phones. 
there's no reason that information couldn't get out there, but we have to measure it first. We're not measuring it right now. Um, and maybe just a, a point about defining quality. Um, so I, I think I see quality as, as really being comprised of three elements. Um, one is definitely technical quality of care. Um, you know, I work a lot on respectful and dignified care. I think that's incredibly important. Um, but first and foremost, we should do no harm. We should make people better when they come for services. And that requires competence and it requires um, uh, the right medicines, not expired and, and effective. Um, so technical quality has to be a part of that. Um, and people are able to judge aspects of that, by the way, the, 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 the patient. Secondly is the interpersonal uh, quality of care, which is just as important um, for some services. Not all services, necessarily. If you've got a broken leg or an arm, you, you, know, you just want to get uh, maybe dealt with uh, quickly and efficiently and, and effectively. Uh, but we know, certainly, that in the case, of, for example, of facility delivery, Women value interpersonal quality just as much as they value availability of medicines in that, in that health facility. And finally is this issue of responsiveness or fit. Again, understanding what people want out of that primary health center. And you know, we're proposing more recently that maybe primary care is not the place to deliver women. Maybe you can't get the volumes high enough to give good quality care. Maybe we should reformulate primary care, reconfigure it to provide more of a focus on NCDs. Maybe that should be the right um, area. So I think we have to challenge our own favorite assumptions and our, uh, uh, our particular uh, compelling notions um, and listen to the population. Thanks, Margaret. That's your last point is very provocative about uh, assisted uh, deliveries in facilities and NCDs. Maybe we can come back to that too, um, at least during the discussion period uh, in, the, in, the, in the lunch break. Uh, let me turn to Srinath and to uh, Yang Zhang in particular on this question of uh, food and drug uh, safety. Uh, devices and other regulatory issues and, and anything else that's been uh, mentioned by the by the uh, questioners. Uh, Srinath, do you want to go first? Okay. Yep. Uh, I think it's very important to have very credible and effective regulatory systems. Unfortunately, medical devices have not been appropriately regulated in India and they need to be uh, regulated. They were mixed up with drug regulation. Drug regulation itself is rather bad and therefore medical devices never got regulated in the proper manner. Now the question of course you're asking is the use of medical technologies inappropriately. Uh, we are now proposing in the country to set up something like a NICE-like institution which will actually do an assessment of medical technologies and then provide recommendations. But uh, the whole idea of both regulating devices before their entry and regulating the use of technologies after their licensure is an important element and certainly I recognize otherwise it can really inflate costs. As a cardiologist I know that all affairs of the heart are expensive, not merely in a poetical sense. Uh, but also in terms of uh, the FDA, the same thing applies. Uh, drug regulation was rather poor but now we are strengthening it at the moment. Uh, in terms of uh, people's anger, etc., all of that is really li linked to quality of services. Because I define quality by four measures. Effectiveness, safety, cost, cost in the sense that cost also should be contained mm -hmm. in terms of appropriate use of uh, technologies for incremental benefit, not just for profligate use of technologies. And fourth is satisfaction. Satisfaction at the level of the patient, satisfaction at the level of the family, and satisfaction even at the level of the providers. So if we can actually capture these elements and do technical audits and social audits, then I think some of the issues that you're referring to can be avoided. And uh, I think that's it. Great. Well, those four dimensions seem measurable, at least potentially measurable, if not uh, actually measurable everywhere. Uh, Yang Zhong. Sure. The, um, the first, uh, the FDA issue, the, uh, the, the vaccine in particular, um, that uh, we know that China has a very robust uh, biopharmaceutical sector. The country is also, I think, it's the second largest uh, pharmaceutical market in the world. Uh, that being said, uh, that uh, the quality uh, control remains a problem to say that 10% of the drugs manufactured in the country are fake. Uh, the, uh, and uh, recently probably you have heard this uh, uh, incident uh, that uh, the, uh, the, uh, it is uh, suspected that the, uh, the, uh, the hepatitis B vaccine was associated with uh, uh, the, the death of eight children uh, in China. Uh, the, the vaccine actually was produced by one of the largest you know, vaccine manufacturers uh, in China. 
and uh, we also um, uh, actually, despite the uh, uh, the presence of a robust from uh, biopharmaceutical sector, that uh, all uh, the uh, all but uh, actually only one so far, uh, the vaccine has been WHO pre-qualified. That is Japan encephalitis. That has just happened a couple of uh, weeks ago, I believe. And uh, so uh, the uh, many of this, these vaccines you found in Africa, in Southeast Asia, probably uh, they are that. Uh, um, the entered in those countries through the, the government uh, in the form of government gr uh, grants. And um, uh, they can't, because they're not the WHO uh, quali pre-qualified, they can't get into the, the public sector. Uh, the, uh, that causes a lot of problems. You know? So certainly China should strengthen the regulation on the, uh, the quality of the vaccine. But in the meantime, uh, you know, given that uh, the, the, the supply chain you know, is now increasingly globalized, I think, uh, uh, it is important for uh, the stakeholders, you know, the uh, international actors to work together. You know, I know that the Mary Lowe is there, that uh, the, uh, the US FDA uh, is the, uh, and the uh, Chinese government and even African governments, the regulators, they are working together to sort of build a global alliance to uh, uh, improve the, uh, the supply chain, you know, the, uh, the quality of the, uh, the vaccine supply. You know. Thank you, Yang Zheng. David, did you want to comment on this? Because I was going to tell people that the next round of questions should all be uh, uh, directed to, at you. To avoid them having to ask okay. me a question, let me, let me just sort of comment that, uh, like you anticipated, from an economic perspective, much of the incentives for quality and lack of quality are inherent in the, the way the system is financed, and particularly the way the providers are paid. So that if for example, primary, primary level physicians are not, don't get any recompense for asking about smoking behavior and advising against smoking, they don't do it. Um, if uh, clinicians are allowed to dispense and sell medicines, they s dispense and sell too many medicines for the wrong, for the wrong reasons. Uh, if people are paid, f uh, hospitals are paid for volume, they keep patients in too long and do too many procedures. So that the, the way providers are paid and the way the financing system levitates more towards or against uh, quality. That being said, it's very obvious uh, what the problem is. Uh, changing it is a really difficult political problem. Okay. So there is, there is a link between financing and, uh, and quality. We're still, we're still searching for that, but we're... We're trying to identify it. Let's take. Uh, what would have we? We haven't addressed the medical devices issue, have we? Well, why don't we come yeah. back to that in the last in the last <laughs> round? Let's take uh, maybe three more, four more questions. Why don't you go first? I know you've been waiting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Talenko from IntraHealth, and I'm the director of Capacity Plus, which is USAID's Global Health Workforce Project. I have a question about decentralization and the role it will play in universal health coverage. Will it be helpful because you'll have local forms of financing, local accountability, creativity, or will it be harmful because you'll lose out on that coordination and economies of scale? Great, thank you. Terrific question. I think there was somebody way down in the corner. Please, yes. Uh, Henry Hatker, retired federal government. Uh, we've been witnessing uh, a revolution in medical care uh, through the use of the corner drugstore where you once were able to get your aspirin, you will now be able to get medical care. Uh, witness, you know, Walgreens, Rite Aid, and CVS. And I wondered about the application of this new concept uh, worldwide. Uh, other nations uh, would be able to provide uh, some medical care at a very low original cost through the drugstore. Uh, what are your feelings on this? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, one or two more? You said you weren't going to ask any more questions, so you've already disqualified yourself. No, Daniel, we'll come, we'll come to you. <laughs> oh, you have a hard one. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Daniel, go ahead. Uh, uh, Daniel Kotler from the World Bank. Um, I have two questions. The, the first is for Margaret on, on quality. Uh, at the bank, we've done a a number of case studies of how countries are expanding coverage. And of 27 programs that we studied worldwide, we found that 22 have a program of accreditation or certification. Now the question is, do these programs work? 
Uh, every country seems to believe they work. We haven't really encountered much evidence that they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, anecdotally, what we hear is that there's a very difficult political economy related to this because there's this new agency that's created in almost every country that's in charge of providing accreditation. They're supposed to accredit both public and private sector. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the public sector, they don't seem to be able to not provide the accreditation. Uh, and there's a lot of struggle and a lot of people are spending a lot of time and, and money on this. So do we know if this works? And if we don't, how should we uh, think about researching that question? Okay. And the, the second question is, I cannot resist the temptation of having China and India in, in, in the panel. Uh, it's about decentralization. In these 27 countries, we find that there's, we have about 12 that are federal countries. And the relationship between the central government and the state governments are very different. In some countries, which I won't measure, mention, it, they seem to be completely dysfunctional, the relationship. But one thing we find in particular uh, that's striking is that in some countries, there's these central government programs that are then adapted and implemented by each regional country, and that seems to be the case of China. Whereas in other countries, of which there's lots, there's a central government uh, program that's implemented everywhere, but then states, perhaps dissatisfied with that program, create their own program. Is this a good thing, a bad thing? Can you comment on this? Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. That, now we're going to have to spend an extra hour on that, that last topic that you just raised. I was hoping nobody would mention it. Thank you. Um, you wanted to uh, ask a question, please. Last one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. When we talk about uh, universal health coverage, and this is also related to the quality, you mentioned something about the structure, trained personnel. You have to have the facilities and then the process of providing care, but most importantly, the outcome, the effectiveness of that. Where do we find other forms of, of healing? For example, in a community, you may have a curandero who is qualified, who has the medication or the means of providing care, and most of all, many times, heals the patient and their satisfaction and respect. How is that taken into account uh, as, as part of uh, coverage and quality. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to close off the questions now and let each of the panelists take uh, two minutes. Uh, Steve Morrison says we can go four minutes over, but only four minutes over. Um, so I'm going to wrap up after the panelists have each had a chance. Um, David, do you want to go first? I mean, maybe just on two questions. The question of uh, uh, the, the corner pharmacy, um, I mean there are a lot of experiments now in uh, developing countries with what has been called task shifting but I don't know what the, the most recent name is but for lower level people, people with less training doing work that people with training has and I think that it's, it's essential to start thinking of that particularly when doctors are in very short supply, they're expensive and they migrate. Um, uh, the downside is that in many developing countries the, the professional unions have been very opposed to this form of, of shift and, uh, and they've been the biggest obstacle I think. And I, I have a nice anecdote that I uh, remember, uh, uh, I, I should be very careful, I, sh I, I, I remember being with Margaret Chan, uh, AD, uh, a director general with one of the professional unions, the meeting with her, explaining to her why they could take on greater responsibilities that doctors currently do. And that was the first half of the conversation. And the second half of the conversation was trying to explain why lower level workers shouldn't do what they do. Um, so they want to take on the role of doctors, but they, no one else should take on what they do. And this professional antagonism to task shifting is something that is a problem, but I think it is important. The question of decentralization, again, 
Um, uh, you know WHO is decentralized and whether you think decentralized is a good thing depends upon where you sit. Uh, but uh, uh, it is very difficult in decentralized systems to have national policies and many of the decentralized systems are now finding the need to try and introduce incentives the way the funding flows from the central government to the sub-national level is now being more and more attached to performance criteria for performance agreements to ensure that some of the things that are critical nationally don't fall by the wayside. Thank you, David. Let, let me move on to Srinath. Uh, as far as decentralization is concerned, clearly India ha has a federal constitution in which the responsibility for delivery of services is that of the states, but the design of the national programs is of the center with shared financial costs. And uh, the states can certainly modify some of the programs, but it's intended that every national program too is devolved to the district level. And it's the district level decentralization, if effective, can really bring about the local context into play. Uh, it's very important for us to recognize that unfortunately, this has led to primary care being neglected by the states because the center has been financing primary care mostly through national schemes, and we must correct this distortion. Uh, but there is also the fact that now the power for some of the expenditure is being devolved down to the village level, to the local village panchayat or the village local elected body. And there is a recent study which shows that after the introduction of the 33% reservation for women-led panchayats, the women-led panchayats now actually have been demonstrated to show greater expenditure on water, sanitation and health with improved outcomes. So that's the positive news. Now coming to accreditation of uh, public facilities, uh, certainly the uh, National Rural Health Mission has established Indian public health standards mostly for primary care and but going up to district level. But in addition now with, through the insurance programs, the public sector facilities and the private sector facilities are having to compete and uh, therefore, there is a greater incentive even for the public sector facilities to get the accreditation part of it. And as far as indigenous systems of medicine are concerned, the different indigenous systems of medicine which are formally, which have formal education are now part of the uh, India's health system, uh, India's public health system and uh, they are positioned in primary health care. So in that sense, they are not excluded. Thank you, Srinath. How do you manage to get so much information on a little piece of paper like that? <laughs> Learn how you do that. And Margaret, you have it on a, yeah, on a, bigger, a bigger No, you had it on, a, on uh, your screen, on, on your screen. phone. Yes. You guys are way ahead of me. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think that actually the drugs, the corner care uh, question and the question on what can community uh, workers do are linked. Um, they're both really getting at bringing care closer to people. And I think that is such a timely and relevant um, agenda when we look at NCDs in particular. We have a lot of evidence now that um, trained and sometimes peer workers can really support good health outcomes in, for example, non-communicable diseases. We should be spreading that far and wide and that's a cost effective and, and I think popular um, patient supportive sort of a, a service. Similarly with drug stores, already as, as has been pointed out, uh, drug stores and, and corner um, medicine shops in, in low income countries, middle income countries serve as an informal point of care for malaria, for other things. Why not be able to weigh yourself there or check your blood pressure as well as, as NCDs um, uh, you know, are, are spreading. I, th I think the question on accreditation is an excellent question. We did a recent review of, on this exact topic, uh, scouring the literature sort of for what, what works on quality. Um, and you know, you won't be surprised to hear that the evidence on accreditation is scant. Uh, there are, there's probably one study in Zambia that looked at accreditation efforts supported by USID and others uh, to try to improve hospital quality of care link, and was able to link accreditation. The methods weren't hugely robust, but accreditation to better in hospital outcomes. It turned out, as you just commented, that that process was so expensive, Zambia disbanded that system. Um, now Liberia, others are trying to introduce accreditation. I guess when I look at uh, the, the panoply of options available for improving quality of care, I think of accreditation as defining a floor uh, of care, not the optimal performance. Uh, so you shouldn't be in business if you can't meet these basic requirements is, is sort of how I think about it. I think it's pretty much how it's used in the high income world as well. And I do think we have to find ways to make it cheaper. 
and finally, Yang Zhong, you, you get the last word. Okay. Well, it's Almost. follow up on Almost. this uh, question on decentralization. If you look at China Act, it's a very highly decentralized system, and not only in terms of the health care funding. We know that uh, in terms of the financing, the central government over the past four years only contributed uh, like 25 to 30 percent of funding. The rest, 70 percent actually, is from the local governments. And uh, also, keep in mind, we're not talking about one health care scheme, right? We're talking about several thousand health care schemes in China because each locality has its own <laughs> program on health care, uh, uh, the uh, coverage, uh, universal health coverage. And that actually contributes the one of the problems of that the decentralization is that it actually, it defa it actually uh, uh, reinforced the inequality in health care uh, access uh, in China because those regions, localities, that uh, are wealthy, that uh, the, um, with high um, revenue base, they could uh, have actually offer uh, better healthcare packages and benefit levels. You know. uh, but the poor regions actually can't because of this, again, very highly decentralized system. And that inequality can be uh, exacerbated by the existence of what we call the patchwork, uh, you know, the uh, health insurance schemes in China. They have, you know, the open uh, employee uh, basic health care insurance system, an open resident health insurance system, and then the new cooperative health care uh, system. You know, so that uh, is just an example of how these, the uh, introduction of the universal health coverage does not automatically lead to improved uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, to uh, improve uh, the qu uh, the quant uh, the the uh, equality. Uh, in accessing healthcare. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. I noticed that as the lunch approaches, the room starts to fill up again. I'm sure there's no, <laughs> no cause and effect there. But anyway, it's good to have everybody back here. I'm going to wrap up very quickly so we can get to the uh, lunch. And there's a lunch speaker coming, Nils Dallaire, who's fantastic. Um, when I do finish, um, let's uh, make sure we give uh, a lot of applause for the, for the panel. I think uh, you have to admit that uh, they are uh, a... Uh, prime group of, uh, of, of, uh, of electricians and plumbers uh, and, uh, and even an architect or two here when it comes to building uh, health systems. Um, now that you've heard about all the different uh, elements that go into a universal coverage system, Steve, I think that during the lunch break, if you can put poster board out there and pipe cleaners and, uh, and, 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 and drawing uh, implements, everybody can construct their own image now of what a universal health system looks like. And we could have a little reporting back this afternoon, see uh, how people now imagine the construction of a universal system uh, based on the elements we've just heard about from our panel. So again, thank you very much. Uh, let's give applause to our panel and... And we have an announcement from, uh, from Matt. Yeah, thanks again to all of our speakers this morning. We have lunch behind you. Please be back in your seats at 1255. We have tables outside for you to eat at, and you can also bring food in and sit at your seats during Nils's keynote address. Thank you very much. <laughs>